Thank you. I, uh, I just want to interrupt the conversation, but not your lunch. Please keep eating. Um, I'm Lee Goldberg. I'm Vice President of Health Policy at the National Academy. Uh, in a moment, we're going to hear from our lunchtime guests, Dr. Sashin Jain and Dr. Patrick Conway, who are going to talk about innovation in delivery and financing of health care and what that means for Medicare and Medicaid today. But before we get started, I want to announce a, a new crowdsourcing project the Ac Academy is launching in February as part of its overall celebration of the 50th anniversaries of Medicare and Medicaid. It's a project that we're, called working, we're calling Working Together that seeks to identify innovation around services and supports for working age people and dis uh, with disabilities using some new techniques, using the whole technique of crowdsourcing. Now, I think we all know that uh, providing supports and services for this population and helping them stay uh, engaged and independent and healthy can pay big dividends, both in terms of employment, in terms of uh, healthier outcomes, and in terms of lowering the overall healthcare costs to the system. Uh, but we, I think a lot of people who are working in this field also know that our knowledge of this population and their needs and how to serve, serve those needs over time is really inadequate. So specifically what this initiative, this crowdsourcing initiative is, is an attempt to get better sources of data to help us understand the incidence of disability over time and the effectiveness of different strategies and so that we, for promoting health and wellness, independence and workforce participation, as well as identifying some, some models that are out there that are producing tangible results and some emerging ideas about how to do new models. Now we know a lot of you in this room and in the academy more broadly uh, have a lot of expertise on this cross-disciplinary topic which draws both from the worlds of income support and, and health care. And next month you'll have an opportunity uh, with a little bit of effort to share that knowledge with everybody else. You'll get an email from the academy about this working together initiative. There'll be a link in your email, click on the link. And what we're asking people to do is, is submit a very brief synopsis, really an abstract of, a, of an idea for better sources of data or emerging models or practices that needs more attention. You'll be able to not only submit something but also look at what other people are submitting and, and vote those ones up that you think are particularly promising. And so collectively, with sort of the wisdom of this crowd and the crowds of, of people who are outside this room who are going to participate, we'll produce a directory of the most effective uh, programs and models and data sources, and hopefully hone, be able to hone in on a few of them that are really game changers. So that's going to be uh, coming starting February and lasting for about two, three weeks. We really hope uh, you participate and, uh, and can, can also suggest people in your networks to participate. So now I'd like to turn over uh, the stage to Dr. Sashin Jain and Dr. Patrick Conway. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here today with Patrick Conway. Uh, Patrick, as most of you know, uh, is Chief Medical Officer at CMS, as well as Head of the Innovation Center and Deputy Administrator. Uh, Patrick has had a very distinguished career as a public servant, uh, originally a White House Fellow, uh, subsequently worked as Chief Medical Officer in the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluations Office, uh, and is uh, a pediatrician by training, uh, but uh, and served as uh, Chief of Hospital Medicine at uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Um, Patrick is at the forefront of leading the administration's efforts around uh, delivery reform and really building the Medicare program of the future. And so it's really uh, my distinct honor to uh, be interviewing him here today uh, on stage. Patrick and I actually first met when we were both medical trainees. Uh, he was my first uh, senior medical resident on my pediatrics rotation uh, in medical school. So uh, we have a long and, uh, and special relationship. Uh, Patrick, great to have you here today. Yeah, great to be here. And you were an excellent medical student. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Patrick, big announcement last week uh, from the secretary. Um, clearly, uh, CMS is, uh, is changing very rapidly right now, and CMMI will be kind of at the heart of that. Uh, could you say a little bit about 
what led to the Secretary's announcement and um, what we should expect in terms of changes to the Medicare program? Yeah, so a few thoughts. Um, one, I think it was <coughs> a, a historic announcement setting very specific goals uh, for the health system, just uh, to make sure everybody's aware of the announcement. So um, we had gone through a period internally about uh, the shift that was on, undergoing and the ability to set specific goals. So we announced um, for Medicare fee-for-service uh, to have 30% of payments and alternative payment models by 2016 and 50% by, by 2018, the tipping point goal. Um, to give you some context, we had 0% in alternative payment models in 2011, uh, are at about 20% at the end of 2014. And these alternative payment models are models where the provider is accountable for uh, cost of care and quality. So uh, either an ACO or a comprehensive care medical home or a bundle. Um, it's important to note that we think it's the public and private sector alignment here is critical. So announcing for Medicare, which we control, but then uh, challenging and offering to work with states and their Medicaid programs, private payers, consumer groups, purchasers, and others to move the whole health system towards alternative payment models. The secondary goal was just was around um, for those providers not in alternative payment models that we continue to have a link to quality and cost. So it's at least 85% of Medicare fee for service payments with some link to quality or cost by 2016 and 90% by 2018. So. For any of you who have been in federal government, it is not that easy to get uh, commitment to very specific goals at time certain. Um, so I think a big announcement, uh, a lot of positive feedback, and then we've already seen private sector organizations announcing that they're aligned with those goals as well. Last thing I'll mention, we are gonna launch a healthcare payment learning and action network. We're still working on the details there, but it, we're really looking at it as a, as a mechanism to have a learning collaborative with stakeholders across the healthcare system about how we can reach those goals. CMMI sort of, I think, plays a pretty pivotal role in actually this shift in changing payment models. Um, you've now had, I guess, four years of, of payment innovations underway. What are some of the most promising innovations that you're seeing, um, and how are they gonna fit into the Secretary's plans going forward? Yes, yeah, so I would name a few. First, uh, accountable care organizations are the largest proportion of, of alternative payment models. Um, both, this is both our Pioneer ACO program and the Medicare Shared Savings uh, program. Um, Pioneer results, as, as I think you and many people uh, know, really positive results. So savings two years in a row, um, majority of ACOs actually generating savings. And then on the quality side, which probably hasn't been talked about enough, above published benchmarks in year one for quality um, across the board, and then improved on 28 out of 33 quality measures year one to year two with a 14% average improvement, and six out of seven patient experience measures. So high quality care that's improving, why we lower cost. The other uh, major model I'll mention is our uh, comprehensive primary care initiative, which Rich Barron, who's in the audience, actually started. Um, but a multi-payer model, 13 aligned quality measures, uh, all payers putting in per member per month fees, moving fee for service away from uh, moving practices away from fee for service. I, I like anecdotes sometimes. The, the best anecdote from this was uh, a practice in Arkansas, four physician practice that literally said, you know, we finally are practicing the way we want to. About a million dollars. They have a very large catchment area because they're rural. About a million dollars total of per member per month fees went into this practice. They lowered total cost of care by significantly more than a million because they're hiring nurse practitioners, they're just, they're, they have home-based visits, so they have people going into the homes of the chronically ill, you know, redesign their practice with mobile technology and other aspects, care managers. And I just think a great example of shifting away from fee-for-service to how both providers, clinicians, and patients want care delivered. The third that I'll mention, um, actually four, sorry. Third bundles, I will make it shorter. Um, but I think our bundled <laughs> payment initiative, we've got thousands of providers um, in that model, many uh, hundreds uh, and actually even more about to move to two-sided risk. Um, and then I'd say our state-based and Medicaid innovation, both the state innovation model and our Medicaid innovation accelerator, I think is a good example of state-based change. Great. When you look at the authorities that created the Innovation Center, Section 3021 of the ACA, um, you know, the most exciting part of it, I think, for most of us was the fact that the Secretary could take successful innovations, innovations that improve quality and reduce cost, and actually scale them 
uh, to the uh, entire Medicare or Medicaid program um, through rulemaking and not necessarily mm -hmm. through an act of Congress, which is what the mechanism was before through you know, the, the ORDI demonstrations. Um, what, what are the plans to use those authorities and when will we start to see innovations that worked at small scale be brought to kind of national scale? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think our goal is to try to utilize those authorities over the next couple years. So we now have a lot of models with positive results. So it's then how do you utilize those authorities? You know, as you know, there's a statutory construct of an actuarial determination, so I can't speak for our actuaries. Um, but I think the Pioneer ACO program, as an example, if, it, if the program improved quality and lower cost, then it could become a permanent part of the program. Um, you know, our evaluation on Pioneer, it was even, it doesn't have to be statistically significant, but the quality improvements and the cost reductions were actually statistically significant as, as well. It's really preponderance of evidence, so we don't have to go here unless you want to. But as an implementation scientist, um, we have to probably think about our evaluation methods uh, for these endeavors. Partnership for patients on the safety side, really positive results. 17% reduction in harm in this country, 1.3 million adverse events and infections avoided, $12 billion in cost savings, um, 50,000 lives saved. So I think once again, a uh, uh, program with really positive results. And then comprehensive primary care initiative, we just posted the first year, so one year is not um, you know, the totality of the model, but the first year results were very positive in terms of quality and cost. One of the, the themes that's sort of um, uh, kind of been uh, part of this conference uh, uh, since yesterday actually was the notion of the Medicare program as actually leading private sector innovation. And I know that um, particularly with, with the announcement uh, yesterday from this national coalition of uh, private sector organizations to support you know, value-based care, that, there are, that there's increasing coordination between the public and private sectors. Um, be great to hear your perspective on the collaborations that you're making with you know, private sector entities around payment reform. Yeah, so I think this public-private sector collaboration is critical. Um, you know, I mentioned the Healthcare Payment and Learning Action Network. I think the whole concept there is how does the public and private sector work together. Let me give you a few tangible examples. Um, so I, be, I meet regularly with the private, the, all the large private health plan chief medical officers. We've undergone a lot of work over the last year on quality measure alignment, um, agreeing on sets of quality measures um, uh, for things like ACOs, comp, you know, primary care medical homes, major areas of specialty care. You know, as I, when I was at Cincinnati Children's, I had to report quality measures to every various payer that wanted quality measures. So I know the challenges of misalignment. Um, so some of these sort of alignment issues may sound, may to some sound small, you know, aligning on quality measures, but I would say that kind of work with private payers, aligning on quality measures, outcome-oriented measures that matter is critical. You know, we also have done work, you know, our innovation center models are very much private sector and provider partnerships. So, you know, comprehensive primary care is a partnership with private payers who are in the model as well. It's also a partnership with primary care providers where we, uh, foster learning collaboratives where they learn from each other. This is not us teaching these primary care practices how to change. It's creating an environment where they can collectively learn and improve much faster. Last thing I'll say, uh, which I know you know, but just to make sure, you know, the traditional demonstration paradigm was run a demo for a very long, for a period of time, you know, an evaluation some number of years later. You know, we are in these models getting monthly to quarterly data feeds and adjusting the model as we learn, which I think is a very different paradigm and much closer to the continuous learning system that we would want. That's great. That's great. Are there questions from the audience? Like NASI is announcing its crowdsourcing uh, initiative today, so... Uh, <laughs> Thought we would crowdsource questions. I have more if you'd like. But, uh. And I apologize for my voice. I've got some kind of virus. Ah. So this is a question actually that builds builds off of. Um, uh, what we were just talking about in terms of rapid cycle evaluation. Uh, the questioner asks, CMMI has moved to rapid cycle evaluation. 
Uh, has uh, CMS uh, or, uh, or demos been able to act on interim results, that, or do they have a lot of noise that have significant time lags? So I guess it's a qu question about the quality of the data that's yeah. coming forth from uh, the demonstrations. Yeah, so we have been able to act on interim results, and I'd say both quantitative in many times and also qualitative results and feedback from the field. So I think, you know, the Pioneer ACO model, as an example, went through numerous changes. The bundles model, I will tell you, bundles, I've learned, are more complicated than I ever would have imagined. And I, I'm still a practicing physician, so I should have realized how complicated they would be. But uh, we have made continuous adjustments in the bundles model as we learn from the participants and from the data. So as we get outliers, we learn from that. We tweak the uh, model, uh, the financial model, what's included and what's excluded, et cetera. Um, I also, uh, you know, when we're looking, we're also trying to look from a contextual factor, from an improvement standpoint, what makes some organizations successful versus other organizations or areas of the country more successful? How can we apply those learnings across the board? So um, it, it really is a continuous learning evaluation frame. One place where NASI and others in the scientific community could help, this is not universally accepted, even within uh, HHS. So I still get questions of, you know, why don't you randomize everything? And if it's not P less than 0.05, I don't think it works. So, you know, I would argue these are not drug trials. We do randomize, actually, uh, when appropriate. Happy to have that discussion if people want to. Um, but uh, these, this sort of implementation science, if you come from a budgetary or uh, background, um, at times, you could be applying uh, what I'll call more of a traditional evaluation paradigm, more of a drug development paradigm, whereas we probably need to think about more advanced or different methods in these cases. That's really interesting. I, and I, I guess it raises this question of transparency, and, <coughs> and um, yeah. I think for the health services research community that's reflected in the room, um, I think there's a lot of folks who are interested in transparency and, and actually seeing the results from some of the evaluations yeah. that have been funded. Are there any plans uh, underway to actually make transparent those results? Or? We do. So yeah. we, um, we post all the evaluation reports uh, publicly available on our website. So there's a large list now. There's going to be even more coming. Um, uh, there actually was a bit of a backlog when I started in terms of evaluation results, and we're getting more and more up. Um, uh, I think secondly, and this is challenging for government, but we're trying to think about how we would more openly share the data. So it's one thing to read a report from a, from a we hire independent evaluation uh, entities that do the evaluation. It's one thing to read a report, but having been on the research side of the house, if you will, in academic medical centers, you know, I think we need to think, and I've been working with our data shop on this, how we more actively share our data with external researchers. You know, innately, for some people, there's a fear that if others have access to data, they could, you know, generate results that are problematic. I, that's not my philosophical bent, if you will. I think it's better if we share the data, we let researchers analyze the data when possible, because then we're going to maximize learning from these various models. Yeah, a big part of, I think, what, you know, what uh, the administration's been working on over the last you know, six to eight years has been data transparency. and. Yeah. Um, uh, particularly as the High Tech Act has been uh, sort of put into place and you now have meaningful use of, of EHRs. How is the, sort of the digital health movement actually influencing what CMMI is doing and what are the linkages between the National Coordinator's Office and, and CMMI in terms of thinking through the next step of, next phase of, of Medicare innovations? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, there are strong linkages with the Office of National Coordinator. I, I'd call out a few uh, areas. One, uh, just data feedback. So when we started the ACO program, I think we were working through the challenges of getting data feedback. We now have uh, much more reliable uh, monthly data feeds to participants in all our models. So they're getting uh, claims data for their population, for example. Two, we're actually giving, in some of the models, we give them information about the other providers in their uh, area. Um, uh, to give you an example, you know, we had a practice that said, wow, you know, I've been referring to this GI practice forever. 
And now I just realize that my friend is really high cost and low quality. And given that I'm now responsible for the cost and quality of my patients, I'm going to have a conversation with my GI practice across the street. So just empowering with data that clinicians don't often have, I think, is, is critical. Um, and then third, on the broader transparency piece, and you know, we get pushed back on this some, um, we've made a commitment, whether it's dialysis facility compare, nursing home compare, physician compare, um, you know, we're going to maximally put out data that's valid and reliable so it's transparent both in quality and cost as much as possible. Terrific. We had several questions uh, posed, Patrick, about the role of the beneficiary voice at CMS and um, how much uh, beneficiaries uh, are uh, sort of consulted in terms of yeah. thinking about payment models and thinking about new delivery models. Yeah. Um, when I was at CMS, I don't, I don't actually remember a real mechanism, a formal mechanism in place to actually solicit the, the voice of uh, beneficiaries. Has that changed at all, or? We, we do have some formal mechanisms now, okay. so we'll talk a few about. One, and actually, so my first job at CMS was run, it was, I'm still chief medical officer and running the Center for Clinical Standards and Quality. Actually, for our quality measure development, we, had, we previously had not had a requirement on the quality measure side that a beneficiary be on all technical expert panels. We now do. I can tell you it changes the dynamic. Um, my favorite story was an orthopedic one where there was all this debate about what to have, and the beneficiary was like, so I basically want to go home and be able to have a better, you know, be able to walk and have a better quality of life and not have a complication. All this other stuff you guys are talking about, I don't really care about, um, which shifted the, which shifted, you know, <coughs> it, you know it shifted the, the quality measurement discussion. We actually developed now these patient-reported outcome measures in orthopedics. Um, Quality improvement, we now require on all the boards and QI projects, beneficiaries and patients. Uh, on our payment models, uh, increasingly we have beneficiaries that are directly engaged in giving feedback and beneficiary groups. You know, I think this is essential. Um, one last story, sorry. Um, when I was at Cincinnati Children's, we started having our hospital medicine fellows, and they got really angry when I made them do this. But I was like, so you're gonna go to the ER, and you're gonna wait for a patient and family and then you're gonna just stay with them all the way through our system and then visit them in their home. So people were like, why are you making me do this? I'm supposed to do research, like, I'm so, you're supposed to be learning clinical. It ended up being their best learning experience because they learn all the problems with our system, all the potential failed handoffs, all the, you know, what can change when you go to home and now this child with 10 chronic conditions, the, you know, the family actually didn't understand the piece of paper we shoved at them as they went out the door. So I think, you know, we need to have a framework that starts with patient-centeredness and beneficiary-centeredness. What, what, you know, just to push on that a little bit more, what, what can we really do, you know, to actually engage the patient voice? I mean, one of my frustrations working in a large corporation, you know, working government is that, you know, we're still doing a lot by anecdote. And so most folks will kind of bring in my mother X, Y, or Z, or I had this experience. Yeah. But the reality is, is most of us who are privileged enough to work in those environments um, have more social capital, have more knowledge of the system. Um, so, you know, how do we actually truly capture the diversity of voices of the patients and, and people we're trying to serve, um, you know, in these complex environments where we're making decisions not just for, you know, ourselves and our loved ones, but really, you know, the whole the whole country. It's a great. It is a great question. I'm not going to have. I don't know for sure what the answer is. I mean, I think, I think one we have to just keep broadening the sphere. So to your point, you know, a few patients involved in shaping something is not the totality. I actually started thinking about interesting crowdsourcing. Um, I may get in trouble. Anyway, I uh, you could you could imagine actually. Uh, really using social networking and technologies to harness a much greater engagement. I mean, you could even imagine, and I'm, I'm not committing the agency to do this, um, but you know, having a way to communicate with a large number of beneficiaries and say, this is what's ongoing now. What do you think's missing? What are the models that you think would be necessary that you would want for you and your family members? So, I mean, actually, I think we probably need to be a mo little bit more creative about how we reach a broader segment of the patient and beneficiary population and their caregivers. Yeah, I'm looking at I'm looking at Tom Lee right now, who's uh, from one of the you know he's with Press Ganey and is one of the kind of leading researchers in the patient reported outcomes area. Yeah. Um, and you know he and Michael Porter have written extensively about integrating the patient voice into um, sort of clinical design. Yep. Um, you know, are, are, how are you thinking about patient reported outcomes as it relates to value based payment and? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I think it's actually one of my meetings towards the end of the day today. I think this, we are trying to push hard towards more p outcomes and patient reported outcomes uh, in our various uh, programs. So um, yeah, I think this is critical. I think uh, we'll need Tom and many other people to think through the issues of what's the infrastructure to collect that, how do you do it reliably, how do you apply it across settings. But I think, um, I think we're now at a place where that is possible. So, um, you know, I always, the pace of change, I always want to go faster, to be honest. That's like my natural mentality. But I think increasingly uh, across our programs, we should focus on patient reported outcomes, which is broader than just patient experience. I know you know that, but yeah. patient experience is a component, but real patient reported outcomes, whether it be functional status, quality of life, et cetera. Um, I think we need an infrastructure to get there. You didn't ask this, but I'll mention it. You know, we, we were testing in Cincinnati when I left this idea of, of a, getting patients' goals of care, and then literally measuring closing the gap to their goals of care. Um, on, that actually makes a lot of sense, uh, I think, scientifically and from a care delivery model. So we don't have that ability at a national frame right now, but I think in the best case world, to really capture goals of care and then, the, and then closing that gap so you're truly meeting, you have a patient-centered focus, meeting patient-centered goals of care, I think is a much better measurement paradigm. Now, on the topic of goals of care, and you could stay, you can, we can stay away from this topic if you don't want to go there. Um, um, you know, I'm naturally sort of drawn to this question of advanced directives and um, and really end of life, and uh, the fact that you know many people enter the American healthcare system, um, you know, sort of really at an end stage of their life, either without knowledge of it or without a real conversation around yep. what their goals are, and you know, it's particularly relevant for. Um, you know, the, the sort of Medicare population. Um, are there any conversations ongoing right now at CMS about things we can do to improve palliative care, improve uh, sort of rates of, of death in hospice and, and those types of things? Yeah, so a, a couple things to comment on. One, as a clinician and as a physician, I think those conversations are critically important. Um, I do think our training and having those conversations also, by the way, probably could be improved. Um, uh, I will say for myself, I, feel I learned how to do that more effectively, I think, as an attending, because I didn't necessarily have that training as much as possibly could have occurred as a medical student and resident. Um, two, directly on CMS, we do have uh, a number of quality measures in this arena. Um, uh, we said publicly in a rule last year that we were contemplating paying for advanced care planning, and the AMA has uh, signed on on paying for advanced care planning. The last thing I want to mention, which um, is a model we started developing uh, fairly soon after I, I came into the Innovation Center and was launched, and uh, we hope soon to announce the awardees, is a model that is essentially concurrent hospice and palliative care services with curative services. So it's called the care choices model. Um, and hospice and palliative care services coming forward saying, at the same time as curative care, we'll deliver hospice and palliative care. There's fairly good evidence from the private market that that can lower cost and improve quality. Wow. We got a very large number of applicants, which is a good thing. Wow. Um, and I'd say from, uh, you know, even doing this with my father, who was a Medicare beneficiary and passed away, you know, it, it gets you out of what is arguably a very false choice between curative and hospice and palliative care services. That's great. That's great. Now, much of the conversation today is really focused on Medicare and um, uh, sort of, uh, I think, be interesting to maybe shift a little bit to Medicaid and to think a, a little bit about the innovations that are coming forth in that domain. I know that there's you know, significant effort underway right now uh, around the dual eligibles, people who are both eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, could you say a little bit about the early results from, from those programs that are underway and maybe some of the other initiatives that you're undertaking in the Medicaid area? Yeah, so a, a few thoughts. One, on the dual eligible demonstrations, which are in a number of states, the results we have to date are, are essentially uh, sign-up rates, which are going well. So a large number of beneficiaries dual eligible entering the model. We don't have quality or cost results yet, so to be determined on quality or cost. Um, the Medicaid Innovation Accelerator, which we announced like, uh, likewise last summer, uh, just started, but this was about a, a little more than a hundred million dollar investment to work with states on things like how do you think about Medicaid financial models, what are clinical topics you'd want to work on, which the first couple were substance abuse, behavioral and mental health, 
and long-term services and support, so, and super utilizers. That was the first four, so very directly related um, to this conversation. Um, uh, and then, you know, I think in addition to that, the state innovation model, it's whole state population, but the, we have 17 test states now in the state innovation model, so over a third of states. You've got 21 additional what we call design states and territories designing their plan um, for changing their whole health system to achieve better quality, better health, and lower cost. Um, so major focus on Medicaid and the whole state's population there. There's a lot of people in the room who are not healthcare people, uh, who work in social insurance issues more broadly, and um, raises this question of one of my favorite topics, which is really innovation in large organizations, and specifically innovation in government, and how do you actually lead you know, innovation within the constraints uh, of you know, large organizations that are sociologically complex and um, regulatorily you know, sort of you know, built for different things. Um, uh, and you're somebody who's, I think, accomplished a lot in a very short period of time uh, in government, um, both in your role in ASPE as well as uh, your role at CMS. So we'd love to just hear your kind of broad perspectives on, you know, leading change in large organizations and, and driving forth an agenda as, as a bureaucrat, um, you know, tr uh, you know with, with wide authorities, but, but also operating within an infrastructure that's not necessarily built to do what you're doing right now. Yeah, it's a... Uh... Where to start? I've read a lot of books. Um, <laughs> in all seriousness, Rick Gilflin, when he left, handed me The Other Side of Innovation. I didn't <coughs> read it. It was a good book. Um, uh, so I think a few things. I mean, I'm actually, um, change management and organizational theory is very interesting to me. My first job out of undergrad was at McKinsey Consulting. Uh, maybe it imprinted on me. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I think this is complex. I mean, a few thoughts, and the caveat here is I don't think I've figured this out. But I think, you know, I think um, a few thoughts are helpful. Uh, one, I think consciously thinking about the different dynamics. I think this is definitely true in the Innovation Center. I mean, you basically had a startup with inside of government. Um, it was literally not physically located with, with the rest of the organization. Um, uh, and you had you know, many hires, as you know, from outside of government. So it's then, you know, how do you capture and harness all that energy and creativity and you know, great thinking, but also collaborate and uh, work well with the traditional business engine, to use from one of those books. Um, and I think that's still an evolution. So I actually uh, have been using a slide internally recently that the Innovation Center was in a startup phase. Now we're in the phase of expansion, embedding. You know, how do you make this the core of the business? You know, the announcement that was made, sorry, this may be longer than you want, no, but this is the announcement that was made on 30 and 50% of alternative payment models. If you have been working in fee-for-service Medicare for the last 20 years, there's a very high risk that that is perceived as what I've done and I've built is no longer a value. And I think you almost have to communicate the opposite. You have the underlying financial management systems and claims processing systems that we will migrate into this new world, and you will be key to that migration. Um, and I think, you know, I think we're making that cultural shift to a degree within CMS, and it's this balancing act of you don't want to stamp out the innovation aspects, but you also have to tie into the broader Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera, infrastructure, and you know, partnering with the private sector. It's challenging. Um, this is by far the most challenging job I've ever had in my life. It's also been the most rewarding. Um, uh, I won't, somebody said me a hilarious quote. I won't actually share that quote recently. No, 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 now you have to share the quote. Now, now <laughs> you have right. to share the quote. That's right. um, You've but, got to share uh, it. Uh, yeah, no, but, um, uh, you know, I think, and it's, you know, how do you sort of build a, and then all the basic stuff of blocking and tackling management, you know, clear vision, measures, strategic objectives, et cetera, making hard decisions. I mean, we terminated a model recently, uh, which taught me very acutely you know, one of the people was, was a staff person. I said, you know, you look, do you want to, essentially was very honest that, you know, I've worked on this model for three years, so I know you say not to take it personally, but this has been like what I worked on for three years, and I get like the results didn't pan out, so we have to terminate this model. But I mean, it was a very personal, visceral reaction of like, what does this mean for me, and what will I work on next? So there's, there's all kinds of sort of people dynamics I think we have to think carefully about how we manage through. Sure. 
Now, on this issue of terminating the model, is there anything that you've actually um, advanced to the actuary? Is there anything that is sitting with the actuary right now that we could imagine might become part of you the? No, I can't answer that. Um, <laughs> Maybe a so, hint. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, so well, what I can say is the the Pioneer ACO has had two years of positive results. So after two years of results, it means that we could start the process with the actuary of, you know, does this meet criteria and would be a permanent part of the program. Um, I mean, the challenge with some of the, you know, as, as you know, I mean, on some ways, four years of innovation center sounds like a long time, but there's a reality that there was a startup phase. It takes a while to get the initial models launched. You know, we get a lot of pressure, like, you know, deliver, you know, a hundred scalable models tomorrow that are going to be permanent. I mean, that's, it's, it's not doable. Um, now what we do need to do is deliver some expanded permanent models into the programs and then build that over time so it becomes a cycle of success. The other thing, actually one other, uh, one of the great quotes that got said to me in a big conference, uh, one of the Aspen Institute meetings, is somebody from private equity stood up and he was like, you know, you have a hard job because in private equity, you know, you, he's like, well, you know, I'm investing in things and new models and, new, you know, and if I get like a 5 or 10% hit rate, I mean, I am a wild success. He was like, but I would imagine for you, like, people want like a 90% success rate. <laughs> and in my head, I was like, that's interesting because very intuitive <laughs> on your part. Um, and so there is this challenge. I mean, but if you're really driving innovation, right, everything can't succeed. In fact, then we're not pushing the envelope enough. So you have this balance you're trying to navigate within government of sufficient number of successes to show that we're testing you know, some models that have the potential to succeed. But also we're going to have things that some people deem as failures that I would deem not as failures, which actually was a conversation I had with a staff member. But we learn from that model test. As long as we learn from the model test and we apply it to the next cycle, then it's not a failure. It's a learning opportunity. Not to be too cliche, but I think it's actually true. I think it's a terrific message. Patrick, thank you very much. This was a, a, an awesome conversation. Uh, really enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks. thanks.